and I think it's faster now because the pain levels are higher. That's the process. No alternative. Give me an answer. Here's the answer. We can do it if we try. They did it over there. That's a big deal. They did it over there. They did it over there. Why can't we do it here? That's what we're talking about. And that is beginning, if you look at that website, community-wealth, they did it over there in every single area I've talked about in hundreds of places, which the press doesn't allow you to know about. And if you want to know how to do it, there's a telephone number and an email. Somebody who actually knows how who cares will help you. That's one of the great historic achievements of the last 30 years is these people have been developed who actually know things and care and can help. And here's the fire department. The steel workers at that point who sabotaged the Youngstown effort, why did they sabotage it? Because the activist radicals in the steel movement, the workers, were an activist group who were going to challenge the international leadership. And they wanted to screw those guys, get rid of the jobs and you'd go down. We don't want your project, we want worker ownership, we don't want you. And they cut them off. That's the, it was a brutal game. That steel workers union is now leading the fight for worker ownership over 30 years. And the transformation in the steel work. This is what I'm talking about. The development over time of ideas, people, and institutions in a context where there are no solutions. There is no liberal answer. There is no conservative answer. There's only pain until a new answer is actually developed. It is an extraordinary moment for ideas and activists and projects. So, and, anyways, that's, that's, that's the answer to Lanchester, frankly. Um. Yeah, I think this is all inspiring and, uh, you know, delighted to hear about, but I want to try to sympathetically challenge one Good. piece of the account here. Good. Good. I've been involved in uh, economics, the environment, and in what you decide to do with the next 20 years, if you're going to put a few decades into this, you have to create a low-carbon economy or else your children and grandchildren will inherit a degraded earth. You've heard that story, so Absolutely. no need to repeat it. But so there's. There's an urgent need for this all to include environmental change. Yes. And looking at that, I'm not sure how much of it can come from the bottom up. So like those those electricity co-ops you talked about, some of them make terrible environmental decisions. But a lot of those co-ops are too small to have the expertise to know what they're investing in. And they were sold, you know, snake oil salesmen selling shares in nuclear plants, and, you know, bowled them over in the 70s and 80s. They made ridiculous investments. So state regulators, the sort of the old-fashioned state regulators in the states with relatively liberal state governments have done a much better job of protecting the environment than the smallest cooperatives that are too small to have technical skills. <coughs> California has, you know, state regulation in California has done remarkable things for the environment. So a continent may be too big, but the states of New England are too small. I think the fact that California is as big as it is is part of what gives it the clout to actually achieve some environmental change through its state regulation. So is there a question sure. of the, the bottom-up account and how big is too big? Well, no, there's, oh, there's, some, there's some, I love this question. <laughs> um, first, the, the history of most of these small co-ops that came out of the 30s, the, the electric rural co-ops, is a very mixed history, I agree with you. The environmental consciousness that is now available to co-op development is totally different. There's a whole generation of people who don't think the way those guys are. I can't, the, the snake oil doesn't go down so easy. So building for the future, I think, in, the, in that way is quite different. Secondly, I agree with you. Some of this has to be dealt with at larger scale. I mean, I, I've been talking about what can be done tomorrow in communities, but I'm absolutely clear that you need to get to scale levels as well. And the question is what principles will govern the scale? And if the principles aren't learned locally, they don't have content in people's head to manage the scale, the scale issues. Thirdly, California is really interesting in this respect. California is the eighth, seventh or eighth or sixth not largest economy in the world. And it has an organized working class. It's the largest organized working class in the country. I think it's about 40% now, the labor, labor union uh, penetration. And, and it is also a much more interesting working class. So there's still labor unions in that particular part of the country that are much stronger. They still haven't found a way around the, the bind of California politics, but it is potentially a regional area where you can actually do things on a regional level. Uh, what has, in addition to the problem that you've addressed, that there are certain things, you know, I just gave the uh, Schumacher lectures a couple of weeks ago. Small is beautiful. 
E.F. Schumacher's got part four of his book. He's, he was interested in appropriate technology. Small is beautiful, but when you need big stuff, you've got to do scale, as he, he was a socialist. And he was interested in appropriate scale. So you, I absolutely must go to the larger level. The question is what the content ideologically and the systemic development of that is. I, I agree with that. What your question raises in a different way, this is the one people get freaky about, but I'll have to lay it on you anyway. If you, is it possible to have participatory democracy in a continent of 3,000 miles in which we now have 315 million people and by mid-century we'll have 500 million and if the high Census Bureau projection is accurate we will have 1.1 billion by the end of the century. Is it possible to have participatory democracy in a continental system of that scale? Probably not. And if the states, most of them, not in California, are too small, and the system is too large as a continent, the unit that is appropriate is called a region. So radical regi regional decentralization becomes inherent in the democracy model. But that one people really get nervous about. Uh, socialists like William Applin Williams argued that point, but people get very nervous about it. But I'm asking, we, not, we need to operate on both what's the pragmatic front, but actually what makes sense. Can you have democracy in a continental system of 500 million people? Can it be meaningful? Probably not. Probably the people control the, the avenues of media and attention will control that. And if most states are too small, the thing in between is called a region. There was a very important debate about this in the left and right in the 30s about regional restructuring, and I think that's going to come back inevitably. So, yeah, way in back, I don't, I'm happy to go on as long as you guys want to go on, but when there's a, maybe some people with the P or something. <laughs> Really good. He said, did you all hear me? He said, the people in Cleveland, do they relate to politics and involved in these projects? The state politics or city politics? Uh, what you're looking at in the Cleveland model is, is not a political model. It is an experiment. But it's an experiment that has ramifications because it seems to be popping up in many parts of the country. On the other hand, the mayor, who has been heavily involved in this and has learned a lot about what ought to be done, the mayor has all of a sudden got some answers to people who have political questions of what's happening in Cleveland. So it's bolstering a liberal mayor. The connections that need to be made, obviously, are much more, I mean, we're talking about experiments on the ground, but the connections have to be made politically, and they aren't made in that case. That's one experiment, very exciting experiment, but the next stages in around the country obviously have to be political. That, this is not political at this stage. Yes? Um, you mentioned, um the last great opening, um, you know, in terms of opportunities and the, you know, the 1930s. And then um, you, you talked about labor unions as sort of a vehicle of liberal democratic politics that emerged out of that. And the fact that um, the issue of race sort of undermined labor unions. And Ira Katz Nelson goes into detail about that and, you know, when affirmative action was white. And, right. um, you know, now that we're looking at this new opening and we're talking about, you know, sort of these new vehicles, what are your thoughts on how we could uh, avoid some of those, you know, those challenges around race? Well, it's a, it's a very good, and that book in particular is a very good book on, on, the, on this. The, uh, the race, you, know, you have to slow me down because I get, I'm, I'm really into this question. The labor, the labor unions in the United States were undercut not only by racism, which they were, and by Ethnic, ethnic, ethnic fights, Italians versus Poles, you know, the corporations played off ethnic groups against each other. But this is the only advanced system in the world, this is not about racism, but it is about terror as a system to control a quadrant of the country on racial grounds called the South. Until the, you know, until the two-thirds point of the 20th century, the South was controlled by terror groups paid for by corporations and businessmen to keep down the working class and keep it divided. There are no systems, like the whole quadrant of the system was at feudal, which means you couldn't organize labor. It's one of the, one of the, among other things, you couldn't organize labor unions. One of the reasons we have weak labor unions nationally is you couldn't get a national labor union if you couldn't organize the South. So it's a very, very odd system in that respect. 
but to answer your question, obviously there's a, there's a t possibility now of a transformative multi-ethnic white, black, brown politics. That's a whole new opening that is potentially available to us if we do, if we do our work right. It's a very new moment, but around a different content, around a content that is not going to be heavily labor union, unfortunately. Well, fortunately or not, the labor unions assumed the corporations and tried to clean up around them and from underneath. This is an argument about changing who owns. Yes? It seems like a really good moment to uh, advocate for a state-owned bank. Yes. Um, and, and I seem to remember that there was such, such a thing back in the uh, 19th century um, in uh, South Dakota, I believe. Still, no, it's still in North Dakota now. Well, North Dakota, is it? Yeah, 50, uh, 26 states are considering legislation for a state-owned bank. Now, how, how many will get there, we'll see. And is there a respectable movement here in Massachusetts? Massachusetts. And so I just saw a really interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal about a San Francisco. Here's a really interesting possibility. I hadn't thought about this, but uh, if you get into this changing ownership of wealth, what you find, begin to see it popping up. It's coming up for lots of different reasons. Like the state, the here in, in San Francisco, the city, you know, the city government has a lot, of, lot of deposits, and the state government has a lot of deposits. In San Francisco, they're trying to set up a city-owned bank using the city government and state resources to fund the bank to fund development. Now, that's a very practical way of saying changing the banking, who owns the banking system. And, and this kind of stuff is now possible to talk about in, in very, very practical terms. Yep. I'd like to just segue to that because right in our city here in Boston, there's a very tentative move to sort of reclaim ownership of our tax revenue by a local councillor, Felix Arroyo, who wants to pass an ordinance that just requires city revenue to be in banks that invest in Boston mm -hmm. rather than outside and I don't know enough yet about <clears> it <throat> but now I'm thinking wouldn't it make sense to go further than that and push toward a municipal credit <coughs> union which I think we already have but nevertheless make the money move into those places so I was just actually going to ask what you thought about that I thought yes. well is that just a pinprick of light in the great space that we have to create no. or would you know is it worth making that kind of demand and now i'm hearing that absolutely well, it is, this is the and i'm going to push that fellow because yeah. we endorsed him yeah. our group of the democratic socialists <laughs> endorsed him and i worked with him yeah, and also beginning to look at these new models that the bank should finance the new models rather than corporations. Absolutely. And, uh, and the beginning but to develop. That's tax revenue. You said they're setting up a city owned bank, but, but that's for community development. What about where the money goes? No, no, that's collected? So far as I know, I, only, I just have to see oh, this I one. See. I think it's a bank. It's the same community. sort of revenue yeah. stream. Yeah, but what I'm. Okay. See, this is what's interesting. Once you begin to think these are possibilities, <laughs> then you begin to think of what could be done here. And does it have a potential developmental stream that could be expanded, or is it a dead end? Right. So I, I'm, not, I'm not a cheerleader for every one of these examples. My urging is that there are far more things that can be done, and they can be examined much more carefully when you actually learn about it and put them in a theoretical framework. So some of them don't make sense at all, but some of them are really interesting. And nonetheless, they show people, you know, you start the experiment, you learn Napoleon's famous, famous phrase, you've got to stop me because I love this stuff as you can see. <laughs> Napoleon's famous phrase, on s'engage et puis on voit. You, you commit yourself like you did. And then you learn. Right. Otherwise you sit back and say, oh, you can't do that. Oh, you can't. No, now's the time to commit. And if you make a mistake, so what? You learn on and go on to the next. Yeah. Just, I mean, that's what's really interesting, but I don't know this possibility. That's what's happening and we're seeing around the country. As a possibility. Yeah, we're seeing it around the country, this learning experience. Well, this one doesn't work and, you know, it's going to run into a theoretical problem. We really should. But you learn by committing rather than sitting back and saying, well, I don't think that nothing's possible. Sir. Uh, the uh, auto-painting uh, through the cemetery was started by a uh, young Arab Muslim man that loses his job because a police woman took away his, uh, tried to buy him and took away his uh, job grass and slapped him in the head. Mm -hmm. So he protested to himself. And started uh, speaking out. Uh, three months ago, the occupied women also started as a protest fear for the country and uh, uh, really demonstrate for the economic inequality. As far as economic inequality is, uh, how are we going to get there? Uh, I don't care what system is, I don't care about democracy, I don't care about freedom, I care about sharing the pie equally 
every every person should have the same income, the same wages, regardless of who's a physicist or a clean shooter. Everybody should make the same. And anybody that makes about the equal income is a thief, is a plug. So how can we get there? That's a good question. We couldn't hear it. He says, I don't care about the systems. I don't care about the rhetoric. Everyone should equally share. And if you can't do any any, any other way, somebody's a thief. Is that fair enough? So how do we get there? What's all this talk about? And fair enough? So, uh, so one answer is attempt the taxation route and redistribution. The argument tra traditionally, and I'm... I'm illustrating it by my little talk here. The argument traditionally has been, and this is where I came out of, out of the American progressive liberal tradition. The corporations run the system. The wealth is owned by the top groups. I'm simplifying. And you build political power by bringing together coalitions with the heart of which is the labor union. And they bring the wages up from the bottom and they build enough political power to regulate and tax and spend properly. That's social democracy or liberalism in a nutshell. That system is failing, is the argument. The alternative to that was, you gotta own the wealth if you wanna redistribute. That was the traditional socialist argument. I'm taking the socialist side of the argument. There was a problem with the socialist argument. They didn't come up with an answer to, what do you do about the giant state? The state turns out to destroy liberty. It's a very, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why the Soviet Union, was, there's a long discussion about that, but nonetheless, the core problem of socialism was, if you invest all that in the state, you really have a problem about democracy. So either you come up with a new answer to that, or you can't move in terms of where you're going. And the argument here is that there is an answer, potentially, and I, all we're doing is sketching a direction that begins with democracy at the community level, changing on the Catholic, on the Catholic principle of decentralization to the lowest level possible, but, but also subsidiarity, where you need higher level, as Frank was saying, higher level solutions have to be there. But start as go as far as you can to the local level and decentralize in the name of democracy and decentralization of power. That's the argument. What makes it interesting, I'm, I think that argument is essentially right in some sense, and we think our sense is close enough to start a discussion. I mean, this book, what we're trying to do is I don't care where we come out on this, I do care where we come out, but the argument of this book is, okay, if you disagree with this argument, what do you want? So the ball's in your court. Don't duck the issue. And we hope that the book will say, okay, I don't like anything you've said. And here's how I think we should go about it. But don't duck these issues. So the answer we give is, you must go to the ownership of capital, and if you're interested in democracy, you must democratize it at the local level, and build from there and upwards. And there is a politics, we argue, that potentially can move that ball at this phase of history over time. We'll see. Yes? Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about how one would get from democratizing and socializing these niches that capitalism has abandoned to the niches that capitalism has its death grip on, you know, the 1%, yeah. you're controlling that 50%. Do you have thoughts about how one goes from one to the other? Is it a master matter of critical mass? or? I'm wondering what your thoughts are about yeah, that. That's where I'm confused about good, how you good, get good from one to the other. Good question. Absolutely. If you, I mean, if you stay at the, new, at the community and cooperative level, if that's all that you get, you've got something useful, but you haven't got an answer. The, ar the argument is that there are several different issues that I think are opening up at the national level. The analogy is with the progressive era and the pre-New Deal era, in which state and local solutions to many problems became the basis of the New Deal and the progressive era. The principles and the ideas and the people and the politics was developed because people understood something in their own working life. And we could go through that, as I said, the women's vote, but you have social security, labor law, most of that started in some of it in my own state of Wisconsin, built up until it reached a place where people understood something that they didn't understand before, and that became a basis when the moment was right. So that's, that's the fundamental principle. So I mentioned who's going to own the mass transit and rail production system. It's essentially the extension of the Cleveland model in terms of principles of organization and, and, and interest in community. So that's one way of doing it. But if you look at the banking system, I think people in, there is a, there's interest in state banking, there's interest in all, there's 7,500 neighborhood banks that are, you know, community development finance organizations that are essentially operating on, on social principles. There are some of these state banks. But if you look at what's happening in the banking system, there will be another crisis. 
There's, there's no doubt, there's no doubt, no, nobody, no expert left, right, or center argues contrary to that. There will be another massive financial crisis, which will target the big banks again. And then what will happen is maybe, if there's enough power, they will be broken up. That's the current flavor of the month progressive solution. And then they will regroup, of course. And then at some point the issue becomes, do they get taken over? I think the scenario with the financial community is, got to, is going to go through that pattern, and if we understand what's going on, there could be a real solution. But you're late, you have to lay down a couple decades. That's almost certainly the pattern. Whether or not we can capitalize on it is really the interesting question. Simultaneously building up knowledge in the state banks and the local banks, which is really, a lot of people are interested in that. Similarly with health care. The health care system, there are 26 states working on, on single payer. You've got one here of some kind, which is going to run into financial cost problems the cost problems are going to force it more and more towards a social model because it can't solve the model without some sort of social ownership. And it's happening state by state. We're going to take a lot of losses first, but I think that one and the corporations are split. I think in the health system and in the banking system, over the next 10 years, you're going to see really big openings because there's crises in those systems and because the interest groups are totally divided on the other side. They're not united at all. There's no big conspiracy. They're fighting with e in each other and they could be exploited and divided. Those are two. Whether or not we get the auto industry again going down, or, what, or the, what, where the next one goes down, there are piecemeal chunks of this that I think are going to open up at the higher levels. But ultimately, there needs to be a politics that has some ideas in its head. And so part of this is developing ideas that so when, when the time comes to actually exploit those opportunities. Sir. Uh, how, okay. How, how do you grasp the How do you grasp the educational system away from the corporations? We should we should we should wrap this up because people are getting uh, a couple maybe two more questions. Um, you probably probably the people in this room know better than I do how to do that. That is to say, it's an organizing problem of a re that is a state and local organizing problem where you can get in there now and begin to try to change the agenda of the, of the education system. But that's there you've got a public you've got a public system. Look, all of this, none of this means anything unless you get people who are willing to act. The question is whether activists really begin to challenge, and that's what Occupy has reminded us. Gar. Yep. Uh, one, one more question after John, and then we can wrap it up, I think. Yeah, I think... I mean, I'll go all night, but uh, yeah. let, let, let people go. This is really great. Um, I feel like I have to go back to school here. But yeah. I want to throw you one more question, which is, ha has to do with, you know, we all hope that... Uh, they won't blow up the world as, as the things fall apart. But how do you see moving the United States towards becoming a global citizen as part of this general democratization? In other words, the danger right now is that they can't resist going into some place where they will bleed, you know, 20,000, 30,000 lives or whatever, destroy a lot of property. <coughs> How do we deal with it? You know. So that now you're now you're asking me a question about my life. <laughs> uh, I was a student of William Atlin Williams, historian of American imperialism, and I wrote a book about the bombing of Hiroshima. That was my first book. Some of you know. And uh, I was writing about foreign policy, and I and I worked at very high levels of the State Department. And every time we tried to do something to help in the third world, unquote, the corporations would come in and rip it apart once we did it. So uh, up close. My own judgment about that is either you can change the nature of this system or you can't really solve that problem. We can try to resist the wars, and I think there is a resistance to sending kids across. Now they're going to bomb the hell out of people with these robot planes. But they don't want to send their kids, and they don't want to spend the money for that, so that, that part of it is being resisted in some sense. But look, it, it's, you, you can't have democracy in the system without democracy in the communities, and you can't have a democratic society without a democratic society that will make the decisions that you want. I really think that if you want to help abroad, the central issue is changing the nature of this system. That's the central issue. It doesn't mean there aren't a lot of things to do, but that's where I'm coming from on all of this. I mean, I, I did a book called Cold War Essays, and the introduction said, it was the last book I did on foreign policy. Cold War Essays said, look, none of this is going to change really until we actually transform the nature of who we are, the less expansionist system that has all the, the imperial attributes that we know about. So that's where I come out on that question. Uh, and one, <laughs> if you 
One more question. Is it Julie in the back? Yes, I just, I wanted to announce that after this meeting, after this, Gar is going to meet with whoever of us are interested in thinking about the implications of this theories for Boston, in particular whether we might just start thinking about some kind of Boston Evergreen-like project, what might be the anchor institutions, what neighborhoods might we start with, who has what connections where. So if you're interested in that idea, um, Basin, which is a Boston area solidarity economy network, we're just, we are having an open meeting for our residents whatever it is to work on this. So just to tell those people interested in that, Stay and if you're Captain Lee and you're interested in that, I don't think that means giving your name and I can put you on a mailing list. I'd like to announce something about the article. Yes, great. Uh, if, if any folks are in a position to show up at the occupation at noon on Monday, that would be helpful. Uh, as you, most of you know, the, uh, the city is maneuvering to try to figure out how to evict the occupation. And the, the judge is temporarily holding that off. And uh, the nexus of the argument, uh, other than the free speech argument, is that the city uh, saying, you know, it's dirty, it's non-compliant, it's unhealthy, it doesn't meet all these regulations and stuff. Well, the occupation is trying to bring in these winterized tents and is reorganizing to comply with the fire marshal's requirements, but the police won't let the stuff get onto the site. Right? So the, uh, they decided that they were going to, as a maneuver to try to get around this, there, there's going to be a big winterized army tent brought onto the site at noon on Monday. The mayor, the police chief, and the fire chief have been invited <laughs> to come down and examine the tent if they have any problem with that, and the media has been invited, uh, so it would be very helpful. Uh, it would be a good time if you if you can get the, the occupation at around noon on Monday. It would be a helpful time to show up. Okay. One more. Is there another announcement? Uh, no, it's not an announcement. Um, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say grappling, but I consider the movement a non-political movement, at least in, in myself. And, and the reason I consider it that way is because I'm trying to find a way not to have this side versus that side. Because I find that's perhaps going to be the best way to have a change happen. You can meet a lot of people as part of the movement. How, how, can you, how do you see you know, f you know, phrasing a conversation to have people understand without getting into this side versus that side? Well, I think you, the first that you have to find one percent and the ninety-nine percent is, is a division. So I, I think some divisions cannot be avoided. But right. what I have found interesting, personally, is that uh, talking to there are people who I call genuine conservatives, and there are political hacks who make their living on pumping out ideology. Genuine conservatives, in my experience, who care about community, care about the kids, are worried about the taxes. And locally, I have found you can, and we're finding this in many cities. You can have a discussion about these kinds of things really, really, in ways that are much more interesting than you would expect if you're talking real. Rhetoric doesn't go anywhere. But if you're talking about, I, I had the experience myself a couple, about a month ago in a conservative part of the suburbs of, of Washington, the Chamber of Commerce had one guy who was the president of the hospital who was a progressive. And they invited me to talk about some of the things in Cleveland. So this is a chamber of commerce. And so I was laying out what it's doing for the city of Cleveland. They were to a man and woman favorable. Why can't we do that here? Why didn't you do it here? You're in Maryland, why didn't you do it here? I said, we tried, the university wouldn't play. Ted and I tried to do this for years. But they understood what it was all about and that the local small business, and they're not the problem, would benefit, and it, but made practical sense. The same night I was in Baltimore talking with radical organizers in exactly the same reaction. Hmm. It made sense. It, it from both point, it actually makes sense in terms of what we ought to do here and can do and maybe expand upon. People get that. If you have something, so that's what's really, in, that, it's interesting to me that it gets you to a very interesting dialogue that goes beyond, it cuts into the rhetoric, but most of the people you're talking about who are so-called conservatives are part of the 99%.
<laughs> and they're being totally taken over by a different ideology. And in my experience, they're, I, I, one, I, one, if I ever say one last thing again, don't believe me, but let me tell you one last thing. I've got a buddy in, in Racine, Wisconsin, who I went to high school with, and I keep up with him. I go back and see him and his wife, and he's a, he's a guy who is extremely bright. He's an engineer, very conservative, very religious, and he, wrote for, he voted for Russ Feinstein. Feingold. Feingold. He wrote it for... Why, why did you do that? He's a man of integrity. He was serious about ideas. I appreciate that. I'll vote for him. Interesting stuff that if you actually take away the... and get down to people, there's a lot more openings than I was aware of. Okay, this has got to be the last one. <laughs> I really love your use of the word decentralized and decentralization and how important that is. Because it has a nice conservative ring to it, doesn't it? <laughs> and it as a left anarchist, right? Even though conservatives typically don't use that term, or except well, libertarian conservatives do, but you don't see that in the political right in American political discourse. Use them using the word decentralized, but it's really a bridge, isn't it, from where we are to where they say they want to go and really what where we need to go. Because it's a great tool to take to under, to help people understand that the concentration of capital in private hands that decentral is the, the idea of decentral is a great tool for that task, which we haven't done very well. We haven't done very well in saying it the way it needs to be heard. But I think saying that power of capital needs to be decentralized offers a, a way for centrists and, and Americans in general to understand what we have been trying to say but have been not succeeding very well. It's, it, I, in some senses, here's, the, here's my very last thing. <laughs> I, unless, it was last night or the night before I was kind of flipping the to do the television just by going to bed, and I hit Fox, not news, but that Greta Van something or other, uh, Greta somebody, very conservative. And, she, here's, and she's talking about um, there's going to be a takeover of the Los Angeles basketball team, the Lakers, and uh, Magic Johnson's going to participate with three or four other billionaires or millionaires. She's reporting this. She says, you know, why don't these guys go and do what they're doing in Green Bay where everybody in the community owns a team? That'd be much better. <laughs> There's some odd appeal that, you know. You... Anyway, thanks very much.